Dr. Karens was performing an autopsy at the hospital. We're going to show you now. This is in what is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. At the time in the 70s was Zaire. During the procedure, he nicked himself with a scalpel. Less than two weeks later, he was gravely ill. And Dr. Karens, you know, when we spoke to you yesterday, you said that at first it felt like the flu, and, 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 and for almost two weeks you had no symptoms whatsoever, you felt completely fine. Then you felt like you had the flu, but, but much worse. So when did you realize what you had was not the flu? And what was it about the symptoms specifically that made you know it was different? You know, the fever was certainly a big part of it. Fever in flu normally doesn't drag on that long. And, and it, it carried on. My wife made very good temperature charts. And this went on for you know, well over a week, into two weeks. And that would be not, not be typical for flu. In addition, the rash that I developed, that would not be typical for flu. So we were realizing this was not a classical flu. There's something more to it than that. And where was the rash? We had heard um, Dr. Brantley, who now is recovering, uh, they described it rash on his torso. Was it, what kind of a rash was it for people who may, you know, trying to understand? So many people are, are afraid and confused about the symptoms. I don't know that I can tell you in detail because, as I said last night, I was in pretty much of a stupor. Yeah. Um, but there was definite rash on much of the body is all I know. A rash on much of the body. And in terms of uh, what was the virus doing to your body when you had this rash and you had this fever that, that had put you to such an extent and such a high fever that you were in a stupor? Well, the, the, the virus is working throughout the entire body. It's attacking cells all throughout whether liver, kidneys, uh, you name it. It's not just the visible like the skin. Uh, it's, it's acting in many parts of the body to destroy. And that's what it's all about. And that's what causes the, I guess at, at first it could be that you're throwing up, you're vomiting, you have diarrhea, but mm -hmm. then, then just right. bleeding. Correct. And, and patients can go into liver failure and renal failure and, and uh, a major organ failure because of it as well. So what were doctors doing to keep you alive? Again, to emphasize to our viewers, given the mortality rate of this disease, you did not even know you had Ebola. That's correct, yeah. The, my, my physician there, my colleague, who the, we were only two doctors at the station at the time, was using IVs. We were, he, they were giving me aspirin, and nowadays that seems very strange because we don't normally use aspirin in people who might be bleeding. But uh, that's what we had available at the time. Um, but those are the big ones, as well as a lot of what I would call spiritual care, um, praying, prayer for me and this sort of thing. Overall, it was a, a very difficult time uh, and very little that we could do to, to cure it. We didn't know what we were dealing with. It was purely supportive care. And it must have been, honestly, uh, Dr. Karens, a miracle that you didn't infect your wife yeah. or your children or anyone else. Because we're talking about a man who came in who died and, and a scalpel that you used to treat him. That's how you got this disease right. and almost died. Yeah. They were yeah. caring for you, not knowing not to get anywhere near any bodily fluids. And yet they, they didn't get it. That's right. Using that word miracle is exactly what I would use too. I can't account for it other than the power of God.